You know, a lot of people talk about hip hop and rap as if it's the same thing. And this is the beginning of a real hip hop education. There are universities that are teaching hip hop all over the country, oh, really all over the world. Uh, hip hop is being taught, hip hop courses, classes. You guys got one here. One of the things that makes your course authentic is when you leap off of the book and into real life. I have to commend you all and uh, Temple University um, and all of you organized, everyone who was involved in bringing me here on such short notice because this is what a hip hop course is really all about. And I'm gonna explain this to you very quickly. Those that are taking notes, if, you, if I say something <clears throat> and you want me to repeat it, just shout that out. Just say repeat it, I'll say it again. I'm gonna run the dates, addresses, times, names of people, uh, and how this movement came to be what you are seeing. I'm gonna give you 30, well, 34 years of history in about 20 minutes. Let's get started. 1970, the Vietnam War is going on. The Civil Rights Movement is at its peak. A gentleman by the name of J. Edgar Hoover is head of the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, sometime in the 60s, 1965 down. Also, as a side note, 1967, George Bush was head of the CIA. Side note. In the, er, in the these late 60s, the FBI issued something called a counterintelligence program. The counterintelligence program was supposed to be the FBI's way of checking up on and breaking apart uh, social organizations, women's groups, civil rights movement, what they believe the communists were, uh, uh, a workers' rights movement, unions, this kind of thing, J. Edgar Hoover was out to destroy that. When he got to the black community, documented evidence, FBI records show and state that he was looking for, I'll quote, a black messiah. The FBI, with all their millions and all their technology, said that when it comes to the black community, what we are looking for is a black messiah. Those are the words, quote. They looked at Malcolm X, they looked at Martin Luther King, Kwame Torre, or then Stokely Carmichael. They're looking at all of these people rising up and they just start making plans to get rid of them. Not so much because these people were a threat to the United States, but because what they stood for inspired you. This is the real argument. The fake argument is Martin Luther King was killed because he was black. You know, they shot Malcolm because he was black. No. These things were calculated attempts, and even now, and I would say this now, now it's out that uh, the government, as you do more and more history, more and more research comes up, you come to find out that the United States government is blamed for a lot of stuff they themselves did not do. That when you reach a, a level of power in this country, you can do stuff and blame it on the United States, blame it on the Justice Department, blame it on the Board of Education, when in fact, there are groups of people with interests contrary to yours. It's just that simple. Some are black, some are white, some are mixed. Some are, and when I say mixed, I mean some groups acquire an Asian African 
connection. It ain't got nothing to do with whether I'm African or whether you're Asian. I'm trading rice with you. I'm trading peanuts, corn, and other agricultural goods with you. I'm depending on you, you're depending on me, but we are manipulating the society for our good. This is a new paradigm in the civil rights struggle. Hip hop starts off in the Vietnam War, counterintelligence program, they're trying to get rid of our mothers and fathers. We're born in that, this is where we start, right here, we're born in that. Our whole generation was labeled X, <coughs> Generation X. The whole generation is X because we were doomed. 1970, heroin is on the streets everywhere. There's a scene in the Mario Van Peebles movie, Black Panther, where they actually show this documented fact that happened, they actually acted out. It was a scene where the mafia and the FBI gets together to discuss how they're gonna put heroin in the black community. You should rent Black Panther, continue your hip hop uh, studies. But anyway, this was real. The government, working on behalf of other organizations, or working with other organizations, not only about working with other organizations, launched a program to stop a certain intelligence happening, a certain happening already going on in the American societies. The problem was their own shortcomings of racism and sexism. Sexism hit them first. The plan was to get rid of all the men, assuming that women had no power and that without a man they would crumble. Hip hop has defied that law. We don't even discuss it no more. It's an old argument if you're a single parent, now it don't mean nothing. Now, it's, it's actually better to be a single parent. There's more, there's more, there are more resources in society for the single parent today than there are for the family. Back in the 50s and 60s, to be a single parent was a, was a scourge. You was looked down upon. Well, you had uh, sex out of marriage or wedlock. Uh, where's your, your man? Where's your, where's your wife? Uh, or where's your, where's your companion? People looked at you and judged you based on this. After the Vietnam War, the heroin epidemic, counterintelligence program, most of the men are wiped out of the society. We, early hip hop, are born. I was born 65. I was part of that clique that grew up when we was in 72, 1972. I'm in the Bronx at this place called 1500, uh, 1520 Sedgwick Avenue. This is the birthplace of hip hop. 1520 Sedgwick Avenue. A guy named Cool DJ Herb used to play in 1500 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx. It was a park next to that building. And actually, I, we really lived in 1600. But everybody from 1600 and 1520 played, stayed over everybody's houses, that and the other. We had it was a great relationship between these two projects. And there was a park in the middle of that called Cedar Park. 1972, heroin is all up in this park. Fiends are nodding. The hot record was James Brown. Get on the good foot. Dun, 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 I'm seven years old. Me and uh, Siobhan Dean, from, who's now Rough Riders and all of them, we all used to live in the same building in 72 had no idea who anybody was or what we would become. It was just that Cool Herc used to come outside and play music. Now, here's where it all begins. Heroin is everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. Heroin is everywhere. Everywhere. It's not, not even like crack. Crack was controlled compared to heroin. Heroin was everywhere. Young kids were on it, old people were on it, 
mothers, for dinner, everybody. Heroin epidemic of the United States. Somebody needs to do a book. Y'all should do the research and do a book on the heroin epidemic from about 1967 to 1977. That is an untold book, because if you ever write it, it's going to expose George Bush and the Reagan and Carter, all of them together. Our voice was never heard. When we watched on, te others watched on television, Ronald Reagan said, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. The next day, it happened to us. If you want to see what life was like, if you want to see what life was like, Hold on one second. Oh, uh, where's uh, Malik at? I'll get him. Yeah, yeah, shut the doors. No one else is allowed in. Let them in either in groups of 10 or whatever. You guys are the last ones. Welcome to the session. <laughs> uh, let me continue. <clears throat> so 1972, Heroin is everywhere. The Vietnam War is taking young men out of the community every day. How many people are here 18? Anybody? You're eligible for the draft. Imagine getting a letter. I got a letter from the government the other day. I opened and read it. It said they were suckers. They wanted me for their army or whatever. Picture me giving a damn set. This, this line that Chuck D laid down spoke right to 1972. When letters were coming to our older brothers and sisters saying, yo, Vietnam War, you have a one-year tour of Vietnam. And you either had to run them to Canada, go to jail, like Muhammad Ali, or go and fight that war. This was our reality. I'm seven years old. I'm aware of all of this. Just to speed you up to 2004, how many seven-year-olds are aware of the Iraq? War, American War is going on today. In 2004, how many seven year olds are aware of that? Okay, stop there. Go back. 1972, I'm seven years old. I'm aware of Vietnam, the civil rights struggle. I know who's the drug dealers, the cops, the crooked cops, the good cops. I know the gang members. I know whoever. I'm seven years old. This is the mind of the hip hop in the early days. Cool Herc is outside playing music. No flyers. You'd stick your head out the window and you'd hear, yo, where that, is that 123 Park? Yo, is that 92 Park? Yo, is that Cedar Park? Yo, let's go outside. You have to walk around, walk up one block. Nah, it ain't here. Walk up another block. Nah, nah, man, it's coming from up there. You walk up there, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, boom. Yo, that's 23 Park. They jamming in 23 Park. And you start walking to 123 Park, which by the way, 123 Park was PS 123. So where Africa Bambada in 1974 would start playing and introduce Zulu Nation. I'm not up to that yet. But I mentioned this Park 1911. I, 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 I mentioned this, uh, this piece. Here, because you got to understand, also looking at hip hop today in its mainstream, back then, the way the, the way we thought and acted was we don't want nothing to do with the mainstream. The the reason we was called hip hop is because we didn't want to have nothing to do with the mainstream. Our parents, we already saw our parents come. <coughs> I want to be down with your educational system. Get out of here, nigga! I want to be down with your American Medical Association. Get your punk ass. This is how our parents were getting treated. You know, I want to be down with the justice system. I want to be down. I want inclusion. It's the whole Martin Luther King art. I want to be down <laughs> with what you know. I want to be down. This is the civil rights argument on one side. I want to be down with you, America. Open the door and let me in. Malcolm X said, rethink the whole thing. 
Hip hop took that advice. In American history, you are hearing Dr. Martin Luther King's advice, which is an excellent advice. I, I would sum Martin Luther King up in this way, generalizing his philosophy in this way. This is what makes Martin Luther King so dope, is that he taught that in the face of hypocrisy, lawless lawmakers, when the people who make the laws are breaking them in front of you, your highest weapon is to stand in the law and by showing them the mirror image of their own hypocrisy, you bring about justice. To do that, you have to let the dog bite you. You got to stand there when they're shooting the water because your purpose for standing there is that this is a hypocrisy to your entire way of life. If I don't stand here, the hypocrisy will not be heard. It will not be seen. If I don't march, nobody will know that there is hypocrisy as you're throwing stuff, spitting on us, and doing all, you know, shooting guns and stuff. Yeah, we have to show the hypocrisy. So Martin Luther King taught us that. Stand up in the face of hypocrisy with justice. Be justice. Don't look for it, be it. That's what Martin Luther King taught us in passive nonviolent resistance. Don't break the law, uphold it beyond the criminals that are coming after you. Martin Luther King was dope, can't front on him. We just didn't take his advice. <laughs> Malcolm X said that. <laughs> Tear this whole thing down. <laughs> Nothing here works. The only solution is separation. Uh, that's it. Uh, if, Martin, if Malcolm X was here today, I guarantee he would have a problem with this whole reparations argument that we are having as, a, as an African community. If you really read Malcolm X and his thoughts on self-determination, self-evidence, that kind of stuff, what black people should be doing within and for themselves, we contradicting that. What we still doing is, I wanna be down. I want what you got. Everything the white man get, we want. Every validation the white man aspires to, we want. And that's some controversial talk, I'm telling you for real. But hip hop didn't go there. 1972, we said you keep your mainstream. Keep it, we don't want it. We tried to get in your dance schools. You dissed us and dissed our parents. Now we create and break it. And now none of your dance schools can make money unless you have breaking in it. This is what we knew in 72. Don't think hip hop is a mistake. Every step of the way, we were thinking, thinking. Stop the violence movement, human education against lies, all in the same gang. Thinking, thinking. This is not no haphazard thing. We knew from the beginning exactly what we were doing and how we were going to do it. And what was the point? Peace, love, unity, and having fun. Africa Bambada, 1974. Peace, love, unity, and having fun. 1974, gang member named Lance goes to Africa, meets the Zulu chief, sits down with the Zulu chief. Somehow he impresses the Zulu chief so much that this Zulu chief makes Lance a, 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 what is called a Zulu king. Lance comes back as an honorary Zulu king to the Bronx in 74 and calls his new organization Zulu Nation. And Lance changed his name to Africa Bambada. It became Africa Bambada and the Zulu Nation in 1974. And with that declaration came peace, love, unity, and having fun. But in 1979, the Sugar Hill Gang came out. Stop here for a minute. From 1970 to 1979, heroin is crazy in the community. From 1970 to 1979, black men are being arrested for no reason. You don't experience that today. This a, like today we have racial profiling. I like laugh when people are like, human in the cups, racial profiling. 
You ain't got no racial profiling in this. Today and to that, no. We were racially profiled. Take it back, do the research. The way society was, was crazy. Crazy. People were getting lynched. In the seventh, in 1970, the Ku Klux Klan was still marching. In 1976-77, our parents were either warriors or cowards. It was only two parents we had. Warriors, and there were many of them. And it was cowards. And it was many of them. Some of them still around. <laughs> Some of them steamrolled your CDs a few years ago. Say gangster rap was detrimental to our children's development. Them same people that front in the 60s. When Dr. Martin Luther King took a bullet, Jesse Jackson was nowhere to be found. Now, I'm not saying nothing. I'm not saying nothing. Come and listen to me on this point. But this is hip hop. And let me take you to this level. Here's the history right here. Who hurt saves us from heroin. The Vietnam War, our dads are gone. The United States government slips, thinking that if you kill the man, the woman got no power. Women raised us. Most hip hoppers are from my generation, are raised by single moms. That gave us a whole different psychology. First of all, we had that feminine creative energy as men. Other men were playing with G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe, macho, I wear blue, not pink. <laughs> Hip hop, raised by a single female, took on feminine psychological traits. Something that this country has downplayed since its inception. Everything is masculine, and everything is analytical in its masculinity. Creativity is a feminine attribute of the mind. Creativity. See, the plan backfired. They took away the analytical identity of us. The black male's intellectual identity was taken away in the 70s through the image of the father. The mother was all that was left. And she gave us intelligence and creativity. We used the creativity to say, you know what? You dissed my moms. I don't even want to be part of you. I see Capoeira martial arts and I see James Brown. I'm going to combine that and I'm going to become what is called a B-boy, a B-girl. I'm going to combine Capoeira martial arts with James Brown and create break dancing. I'm going to take the hieroglyphics, the concept of Egyptian hieroglyphics, and the concept of cave art that appears some 20,000 years ago in Northern and Southern, and Southern Africa. I'm gonna take that concept and I'm gonna put it all over the streets that I live on. It's called graffiti art. I'm gonna express my intelligence whether you tell me I can or not. I'm gonna dress the way I wanna dress whether you tell me I can or not. I'm going to be me, whether you tell me I can or not. Our parents, most of them, were waiting to be told they can do this, they can do that. It's OK to do that. It's OK to do that. You know what that argument is? She's the first black woman to win or something. That stupid talk. Oh, you so articulate. That. Th 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 that, waiting for someone to validate you, for you to say, now I exist. Most college students, you guys go through this all the time with validation, as opposed to validating yourselves. 
in this instance, take it, this is a hip hop parable here, and I'll get back to the history lesson. This year, when you go to your graduation, or whenever you get to your graduation, <laughs> whenever you get to your graduation and you pick up your receipt, I mean your degree. <laughs> What I'm talking about. You see, there's something to be said about being free and being freed. Our parents were freed. We are free. Our parents were free. They fought for all of our freedom. They were freed. The Emancipation Procrastination <laughs> Proclamation <laughs> is supposed to, and actually the Emancipation Proclamation doesn't really free the slaves, actually. Uh, it's the uh, United States Constitution, thir 13th Amendment. Uh, uh, the 13th Amendment actually deals with slavery and abolishes it, well, uh, deals with it, I'll put it that way. Close that door for me, please, thank you. Come on, come on, come on, thank you. You know, uh, I mentioned this, because the difference between being free and being free is when you are free, self-creative, self-evident, you self-actualize. Free is, I can't move until I get this authorization. I'm not a business major until I get a business major's yeah. degree. Yeah. I'm not a computer engineer until I get the computer engineer degree. I'm not a doctor, really, until I get the doctor's degree. Wrong! Hip-hop looked at it the completely different way. We said, I am. Said, so, I am. I have no credentials, no validation, none. But here's the difference between me and you. When someone says, what is your name? You say, my name is Bob, Bob Barker, how you doing? <laughs> when you ask a hip hop, what is your name? Yo, I'm DJ Bob Ski from 125th. You want to get that the fuck? The difference in psychology is this. Yo, man, I'm just some um, Bob Barker. <laughs> That person is like that because they are connected to their, in other words, their well-being is connected to something outside of themselves. You get this low self-esteem when your well-being is connected to something outside of yourself. This is the beginning of poverty right here. I want, meaning that I don't have. And what I want is more valuable than what I already have. The mainstream told us, they said, the mainstream said, everything that you have has no value. Your clothes, your furniture, everything has no value. The only way you have value is if you come through us, mainstream institutions, and on top of that, we're not letting you in. So look at, look at what we're up against. We're not letting you in, but this is the only place you can be validated. This is the only place we believe you should be, is in college, uh, in the army, in it. but we ain't letting you in. So we're sitting outside, ready to die. But we didn't. We said, because you're not letting us in, cool, keep everything you got. We're going to create our own thing over here, and you're not getting in this. This here, we're creating. This was the attitude in 72. The attitude was, the record was, we got our own thing. Flash used to cut that up. We got our own thing. We got it. He used to cut that up. Cats used to, it wasn't about the record. It was about that feeling of, yeah. We got our own thing, dressed different, man. Put on the lead suit with the bell bottoms, 
blocks, his elbow glasses, Kango hat, got the graffiti piece on the back with a big boom box <laughs> to find all more in my presence. I'm blasting this box, loitering laws going across <laughs> Whatever the order is that is oppressing me is now out of order. I have sound and light. Our boom boxes and our graffiti art taught the whole United States mainstream. We wasn't in college. We wasn't in none of that. We tagged on the college wall. <laughs> and people said, yo, what's that? Oh, it's a gang. Oh, it's art. Oh, it's not. Oh, it's this. What was the point? Here's the essence right here. When it was time to say our name, we told a story about ourselves that was better than what we were at that time. We, was, we spoke higher than what we were at the time. 1979, Rapper's Delight, a group named the Sugar Hill Gang comes out. One of the most famous lines that all the kids in the ghetto would sing along with. Here's the line. So after school, I take a dip in the pool, which is really off the wall. I got a color TV so I can see the Knicks play basketball. There was another part that said, I got a Lincoln Continental and a sunroof Cadillac. And then, so after school, I take a dip. They didn't have none of this. <laughs> the people listening to them didn't have none of this. But this was the essence of hip hop. When I say I have nothing, legally, I have nothing. But I got a rag. I got a handkerchief, a rag. Dirty rags. Rag costs 10 cents to make a rag. I could go to Prada because that's the validation and buy a rack from Prada. And because I spend $400 on a rag on my head, I have been validated by Prada. What we did was we said, give me this rag that you just wiped the furniture off with and it's in the dishes and the car. Let me put that on my head. On the head of a man or woman that believes in themselves, a worthless rag becomes a $10 million fashion item. The rags that we wear on our heads, the handkerchiefs that we got on our heads, that's a $10 million business. When that started, those handkerchiefs were given away for free. You can't get those handkerchiefs for free today. We used to get them for free. It was so common and just useless. It's like, it's like hip hop saying, we're gonna put rolls of toilet tissue on our wrists and that's gonna be the new thing. <laughs> and because we walk around like, you son, I got a show. The roll of toilet tissue on the wrist. Yo, I got the clean one. What you got, man? <laughs> Yo, the toilet tissue on the wrist. It was just that crazy that we put candles on, all this stuff, start walking around like this. What's your name, Super Bob Ski? Yo, take my gazelles off. Yo, listen, man. I got a Lincoln Continental, and I was like, I don't have none of this. But this is what I thought of myself. When somebody said, who are you? I didn't say I'm broken, poor, uneducated, and going nowhere. <laughs> Even though I was. <laughs> Bro, uneducated and going nowhere. But hip hop came upon all of us in the ghetto, 1972 in the Bronx. It just came on us. And all of a sudden, we started to reject the mainstream. And that was the essence of it. That's why cats that want to run to the mainstream today are playing themselves, and that's why we say they're not real hip hop. <laughs> the original essence and concept 
of hip hop was create the parallel community. Create an entirely different community. We ain't hung up with racism, sexism, whether you're gay or straight, rich or poor, uh, Jew, Christian, Muslim, hip hop ain't got them problems. And this is what Africa Bambada was dealing with. He put a record out in 82 called Planet Rock. Excuse me, teacher. Yes. Yes, indeed. He put out a record called Planet Rock that included all races of people, but we didn't have a voice. Today they try to tell you that hip hop is an African American thing. It's not, in its essence. Africans, of course, we are the antenna to the universe, can't run on that. <laughs> However, when you discuss hip hop for real as a cultural movement, I invite you guys to watch movies like Wild Style, yes. like uh, Style Wars, uh, the graffiti art documentary, Style Wars. Style Wars, by the way, is a graffiti art documentary that shows it's, it's our only documentation of white youth participating in hip hop in a serious way in the mid 80s. Because people believe today, hip hop is just a black thing and a black male thing, and all we're doing is ducking and pimping and all that and talking about women and this, that, and the other. And to be honest with you, you know, black women don't even buy rap music. <laughs> to be honest with you, it's, it's white women and white men, young white men, and some artists get a predominantly of, of white women that buy rap music product, the mainstream rap music product you see on the television today and on radio. And the struggle within hip hop, even today as a movement, is that what you see on television and radio does not represent the totality of us. We're not gonna front. <laughs> we more thugged out than your president, George Bush. But I will say this, that there is a balance to how we present ourselves from day one. We was always beyond race. Because like I pointed out at the beginning, here's the new problem. Most of our parents were against us. Imagine being black in the 70s, and before you even get out the door, your father or your mother or just your mother is on your back. Turn that noise off. Don't be writing on my furniture. Don't be. The white community. Oh, but don't even forget moms. Moms was poor with us. Okay, that's the first line of defense. You get past moms and you get outside, the cops are right there. If you get past them, you get to the black intelligentsia. They got no time for you. You get past them, you get to the black church. Oh, son, pull up your pants. Before I can be saved? 